some of what I'm going to talk about is going to be perfectly clear to some of you. I don't know how many, somewhere perhaps between 5 and 95% of you. And the reason it will be so clear to you is because I'm going to be talking about what it's like to be me. And I'm just like some of you, between 5 and 95%. Others will not understand perfectly what I'm talking about. And they won't feel too good about it. And they may feel a temptation to sneer. To those people I say, would you mind if I just have a chat with the others? <laughs> and I'll come back to you in about 10 minutes, if that's okay. When we were growing up, you remember what it was like. We seemed to start out in life with a feeling that other countries were somehow just more interesting even than our own wonderful country. In other countries, there were so many exciting different things to be discovered. New landscapes, new food, new people, new customs, new history, new language. And the people who lived in those other countries, we expected them to be somehow even more interesting than the interesting people in our own country. More exotic, more extraordinary, more wonderful, and we couldn't wait to meet them. And we saw the whole of the earth as being a magical complex place, full of magical rooms that we could walk in and out of, and perhaps spend the rest of our lives discovering that extraordinary place. And the first time we saw that photograph of the Earth taken by NASA, that blue ball hanging in space, yes, our heads said, great photo, but our hearts said, home. And somehow we never had any difficulty imagining the world. We never had any difficulty imagining the six billion and then seven billion of our brothers and sisters, as brothers and sisters. Our minds could open, and we could understand that, and it felt good. But then as we started to grow a little bit older, we discovered that the really big issues that concerned us were being managed by a system called politics, which kind of puzzled us. There seemed to be a lot of overgrown children squabbling about things that didn't seem to be terribly important. And just like children, instead of really trying to reach solutions, what most of them seemed to spend their time doing was blaming the others for the things that went wrong and grabbing the credit for the things that went right. And we looked at these children arguing in our parliaments, and we felt at first slightly amused and then slightly incredulous and finally simply aghast that these were the people who seemed to be running the planet. And we saw in the newspapers and we saw on the television awful, gigantic things happening. People starving, people killing each other, people not understanding each other deliberately, not accidentally. And the planet melting. One day we noticed we'd broken the weather. And the children continued to squabble and continued to argue. And then they wanted you to join a thing called a party. A party where you sign up blind to every damn thing they're ever going to do, whether you like it or not. Now, these days, of course, we don't really like that kind of system. If we like a track, we buy a track on iTunes. We don't buy the whole album. And yet, politics seem to be like that. You had to buy the whole album. In fact, you had to buy the artist's entire career, whether you liked it or not. And when they failed or made a mistake, you had to pretend that it was the fault of the others. And at times, it started feeling even really rather like a nightmare. You had this recurring nightmare that you were on a ship, and the ship was being blown towards the rocks and towards disaster, and you somehow were the only passenger that could see what was about to happen. And yet the captain and the crew were fighting about who should hold the steering wheel. And as in all nightmares, you tried to shout and you tried to warn them that we were being blown towards the rocks, and no sound came out. Nobody could hear you. That was my nightmare, too. 
Well, it all sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But one thing I can say to reassure you and reassure myself, there are at the very, very, very least 350 million of us in the world today who feel exactly like that. You'll forgive me if, within my short allotted time span, I don't explain exactly how I got to that number. But 350 million is a very conservative minimum. And actually, in reality, there are probably several billions who don't need very much encouragement, really, to understand that the world is the way that we see it. The world is the thing that counts. Humanity is the thing that counts. Now, I have spent a bit of time thinking about what is the problem and trying to figure out what is the solution in the simplest possible way. Last June, I created this index called the Good Country Index. I won't spend time on it now, but you can look at it on goodcountry.org. And what it tried to do for the first time was to measure what every country on Earth, or at least 125 of them for which there was sufficient data, contribute to humanity and to the planet. Not what they do at home, but what they do for all of us. Because we do now live, whether we like it or not, in a single system, and we've always lived on a single planet. And so what countries do, not just for their own citizens, but for every man, woman, and child on Earth, is incredibly important as never before. And it seemed to me that it would be a good idea to try to measure, to do a balance sheet for every country, and to look not at how successful they are at home, but what exactly is their contribution to humanity. And I released that uh, back in June, and it's the beginning of a series of initiatives that I'm going to be announcing over the next few years to try to achieve something really very ambitious. Now, it is ambitious, but to the number of you who I mentioned right at the beginning, the cynics, the realists, the hawks, the ones who I said at the beginning may be sneering a little bit at what I'm saying, well, I want to say a couple of things to you. First of all, I'd like to ask, who have you been mixing with all of this time that you have formed that view of humanity, that they are selfish, that they are self-interested, that they will grab for themselves given the chance rather than give to somebody else? Which planet have you been living on that you formed that view that humanity is like that? Certainly not the same planet I've been living on. Every day that passes, I am more and more confirmed that it's better to see the good in people than to see the evil. And I think the other thing that I would like to say to the cynics and the hawks and the realists is, we've tried it your way, and it doesn't work. So let's try it the other way. The big problem in the world as I see it is selfish nations. When a child is born, we are born with loyalty only to ourselves. We're perfectly selfish beings. That's the way biology works. And then as we grow, we gradually learn to transfer some of that loyalty to our mother, and then to our father and our siblings and our blood tribe, where we've got to in the 21st century is that most of us have learned to transfer our loyalty to an invention called the nation state. This is, I hope, a temporary because a pathological situation where nations tend to look inwards and consider only the selfish cause of their own selves and their own citizens. We've heard a lot about that in the other talks. That, I think, is the problem, and I think the solution is pretty straightforward, and I want to tell you about that very briefly. The solution is what I call the dual mandate. All governments, whether they're governments of nations, of cities, of regions, of villages, or the management of companies, the management of civil society organizations, they all operate according to this understanding of a single mandate. And the mandate is they are responsible for their people and they are responsible for the slice of the world's territory that they occupy. That's their job. That single mandate, I think, has now run its course. It's no longer sufficient. If we're going to tackle the gigantic problems that face humanity today, the shared borderless problems of climate change and human rights and terrorism and economic catastrophe and all of the other things, we are going to have to learn to operate in a different way and we are going to have to tell our governments that they need to operate in a different way. The dual mandate is pretty simple. What it says is this. Yes, you are responsible for your own citizens, 
but you are also responsible for every human being on the face of the earth, the entire seven billion. Yes, you are responsible for your own nation, your own slice of territory, but you are also responsible for the entire planet. That's the dual mandate. Now, obviously, the proportions will change from case to case. Most of the time, governments will have to prioritize their own citizens. That's normal and it's natural. But the dual mandate requires that one day, in five years, in ten years, in a hundred years' time, I hope it's not a hundred, governments will understand that no matter what the priority, no policy discussion will ever take place again where the international dimension is left out. Whether we're discussing something at a village level, whether we're discussing something purely domestic, we must always remember the external factor, the rest of humanity and the rest of the planet. This is a new habit of thought, a new culture of governance, which we need to adopt, and we need to adopt it worldwide. Now, that's not going to happen just because I tell governments that it's got to happen. Governments will only adopt that new culture, which is a difficult and painful process to go through, if you, we, tell them to. We, the demos, have to demand that. And the sentence I used in my last TED talk was the very simple one, the cry that we have to let our governments hear, which is, I want to live in a good country. It's not enough to live in a successful country. It's not enough to live in a happy country. We have to live in a good country so that we know that our contributions, the things we're proud of, are contributing something not just to us, but to everybody on the planet. This is where we need to get to, and this is, I think, where we will get to. I think it's where we're already going, but we need to push it along a bit. Now, there's a good way and a bad way of encouraging politicians to do this. The bad way, I think, is by criticizing and protesting and harassing them, trying to embarrass them, trying to shame or mortify them into changing their behavior. Take it from me, that's my job, I advise politicians, and what I've discovered is that if you try to criticize or shame or humiliate them, they will just carry on doing the same thing, but they'll just do it in secret. That's what happens. So what we need to do in order to encourage politicians to fulfill the dual mandate is we have to love bomb them. We have to th project fantastic, creative policy ideas at them, 23 hours out of every 24. We have to form competent teams all around the world who can actually produce better solutions, who can prove that the domestic agenda is not incompatible with the international agenda, in fact, quite the contrary. An international solution or an internationally informed solution to any domestic problem will be ten times more powerful than simply a domestic solution because all problems today are global. And we need to find the means and build the systems that will enable us to give our politicians and our managers fantastic, imaginative, creative solutions that manage to combine the domestic and the global, the local and the international. That's the way we need to do it. And I think that what it probably needs is it probably needs a country to take the lead. It could be almost any country, but why not Greece? One of the reasons why I was particularly happy to have been invited to this event in Athens is because I'm very interested in Greece. Greece is in a unique and remarkable position in the world today. You're in a position where you are able to change. You see, when a country is doing well, or doing normal business, it's sailing serenely across a smooth sea, its course is set, it's really very unlikely that it's going to change direction. It thinks it knows where it's going, and it thinks it knows how to get there. And there is enormous resistance to change when things are going well. But when things are going badly, then change becomes necessary and people's minds are open to the possibility of change. And when a country has actually struck the rocks, then it has no option but to set a new course and to set out across what Homer called the wine-dark sea and to find a new port and to head for it. So Greece is in that extraordinarily privileged position where it could make a cultural change in the way that it runs and organizes itself from the national government 
right down to the smallest village community, the smallest company, even families, and say, we're going to make a policy decision, a strategy decision, a philosophical decision that we're going to operate according to the principles of good. Greece could do that. And if it did that, a great many extraordinary things might happen. I'm not suggesting that Greece should try to become the goodest country on earth just because it's a good thing to do. And it is a good thing to do. I'm not suggesting that Greece should do it just because it's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do. I'm not even saying that Greece should do it because there are benefits, and there are benefits. If Greece does this and gives people around the world simple reasons every day to feel glad that Greece exists, then Greece will find that it is admired and respected and trusted and loved by the international community in a way that it hasn't experienced for 2,000 years. And that will make the Greeks feel so much better than they've felt in such a long time. And of course it brings benefits. If people love and trust and admire and respect you as a nation, they want to do business with you. They want to buy your products. They want to visit you as tourists. They want to invest in your economy. And that's a pretty good reason, but it's not the reason. The reason why Greece should try to become the goodest country on earth is because one country must if the others are going to follow. And so, because it can, Greece must lead. Thank you.